Hey there, Brian Goulet here, GouletPens.com, and it is episode number 201 of Goulet q and I'm over 200 now. That's that's just crazy. It, it feels a little weird for me because the rhythm of the videos has been broken up a little bit. I was traveling a bunch, came back, did like one or two normal ones, and then did one in the car, did the Q&A 200 with the office tour last week. I started a new video series called Right Now, which I've got four under my belt as of when I've shot this, probably five if I shoot one tomorrow, which I'm planning on. Um, it's just been kind of crazy for me. So the whole rhythm of my normal videos thing is, is uh, just been upended a little bit, which is fine because I actually love uh, kind of mixing things up a little bit and doing some, some fresh new things. And I think the right now has been pretty cool. If you haven't seen right now yet, go check it out. Basically the rhythm that we're doing is, you know, I come in in the morning, I have a very loose idea of what it is we want to talk about and who's going to be in it. The idea is it's always somebody more than just me, you know, having me, Drew, Rachel, and then eventually what we're going to do probably starting next week is we're going to rotate people out uh, from other other teams. So you get to meet more of the Goulet team uh, that you may, may or may not interact with on a regular basis. So that's really cool. I'm super excited about the whole concept. It's very much been like not by the seat of our pants, but pretty much <laughs> we're like doing a little bit every day and there's some like audio issues one day and a video issue the next day because we're like, we are so just like trying to pound these things out and learn as we go. Uh, so Andy's been super flexible. Thank you, Andy. Uh, all of you have been super flexible. Giving us feedback on YouTube has been pretty awesome. So be sure to check that out. We're trying to give super, super value get really up close, show you actually writing with stuff, swapping up inks, you know, just really it's the idea is it's something friendly, like you're just like getting together with friends and getting to play with the stuff. Um, so it's stuff that we have with us around every day anyway, and we thought we just want to share with you all. So check that out, give me feedback about how we're doing there, uh, but expect a lot more of those to be coming. Um, on the personal side, uh, let's see here. <laughs> My daughter had to get stitches last week. That was the first time we've had anyone really... Rachel never had to get stitches, neither did I as kids. Um, our son is is eight and has never had anything like that. Um, but our daughter needed stitches. She was, I won't get too graphic, but she we were closing the door hatch on our SUV and she came running around the side and smacked her head right into the edge of the door. Uh, it made for a very dramatic Friday evening for us last week and uh, spent a couple hours in the ER. And like, because the flu epidemic is going around right now, everybody had like masks on and stuff. So we're trying to like not completely freak out. Uh, but Rachel and I were pretty shaken up by the experience. Our kids were shaken up and we were kind of got through it as a family. So it was a good learning opportunity. She's great now though. I mean, she's just fine. Got the stitches removed and she's healing great and all that kind of stuff. So she is a trooper for sure. Um, and she's back to her good old running around, scaring the heck out of us with every thing that her head comes near. But you know, that's how it goes. So she's doing just fine. Um, so uh, let's see here. Uh, some other stuff that we have going on is the uh, hanger project, uh, ultimate gentleman accessory giveaway. Don't be thrown off by the gentleman part. That's that's their company is gentleman is accessories, but contest is open to all, of course. Um, but we contributed a Pelican M805 Ocean Swirl and a bottle of Onyx ink and a Leuchtenberg notebook. So, and then there's some other really cool stuff in there. So the contest is open for three weeks. I think we've done, we started on Monday this week. So um, we got about two, two and a half weeks left on that. So if you're watching this Q&A well after it publishes, you've missed out on it. But if you're going to catch it in the next couple of weeks, go ahead and sign up. There's like a bunch of different ways to enter and it's a prize package worth two grand. So it's worth taking a couple of minutes if you think you would like that stuff. Um, another really cool thing that we did this week uh, that I haven't really talked about yet in the right now actually is we started a uh, Facebook group called Goulet Nation. Um, that's uh, something that has come up <laughs> previously on like Periscope and other things like that is, uh, is the hashtag Goulet Nation. So we decided to call it the Goulet Nation. Uh, I promise you I'm not just some like vain egocentrist uh, trying to name everything about myself, but um, you know, it kind of came up from the community. So we set it in there. Uh, we got over a thousand members in there already, which is pretty cool. It's a private group technically, but just ask us to be in it and we'll pretty much let you in. So um, it's pretty cool. It's very, very active. I'm really encouraged to see that. I'm trying to jump in there and post a few comments myself. 
it's there's a lot there. It's a very vibrant community, so it's a lot of fun. So if you want to connect with other people in the pen community, um, that's another place that you can do that. Lots of good places. There's Pen Addict Slack. There's the Fountain Pen Network. There's a Fountain Pen Network Facebook group too. Um, there's the FP Geeks Forum. There's a lot of like really cool kind of places within the pen community. Um, of course, then there's like YouTube and Instagram and all that kind of stuff. You can search around on hashtags and people that are following and. And that's really cool, but um, if you happen to be active on Facebook anyway, it's another place that you can go and hang out. So that's kind of fun. And then uh, another thing I wanted to kind of call out is uh, I just discovered this on Instagram, actually. Um, but Pens and Gaming and Hoppy Pens uh, started up the Empty Ink Bottle 2018 hashtag, uh, which is kind of a challenge, which is basically you pick an ink, uh, you know, any bottle, any side, whatever, um, and you finish it by the end of 2018. So the hashtag is kind of filling up. It's got a couple hundred people in there already posting either what they want to, what they want to, you know, use up or what they have used up. I actually kind of stumbled upon this by accident because I had just finished up a bottle of Noodler's Black Ink, which is the ink that I use for um, the Nib Nook, right? So I've actually used one complete bottle of it before. This is my second bottle that I've completed. Um, and uh, this is my brand new bottle here, but I completed up another one. And uh, so I have, I had an empty bottle. And then like that night as I was posting it on Instagram, I found that hashtag. So I just wanted to shout that out to you. If you happen to be active on Instagram, go check out that hashtag. It's pretty cool. It's just motivating to see people that are like using, like actually using stuff. And because I know sometimes it can seem like you never finish a bottle of ink, but it's kind of interesting to seeing uh, what other people do are doing. Um, there's all kinds of uh, new product stuff that uh, may or may not be coming. The timelines are so loose and we're hearing about things left and right at sporadic times and timelines are ever shifting. Um, but uh, the biggest thing that we have had recently is the um, Lamy All-Star Vibrant Pink as well as the All-Star Vibrant Pink Ink. And uh, I did talk about these a bunch in right now, so I won't rehash all of that uh, right here for you. But the ink does have just a little bit of shimmer to it. Um, a little bit of sheen to it as well, which is kind of cool. And then I'm getting some feedback, especially like on the Goulet uh, Pens review uh, page, about the pen not being as pink as people expected. This is one that the lighting varies a lot. It definitely has a magenta-ish kind of purplish tinge to it. I tried to get that out there. We tried to show in the right pictures, but it really varies so much. So, um, you know, by all means, if you got that pen, I know a lot of you are getting your Vibrant Pinks now or have just gotten them. Please give us feedback on that. We're not trying to, you know, trick you or anything like that. I think the name Vibrant Pink can mean so many things to so many different people. Um, but I want you to love the pen. So seriously, if you love it, great. If you are disappointed by the color just because of, you know, it's a kind of a shifty color uh, in terms of how it looks in different lights. Um, let my team know. We're completely ready for that feedback, and uh, that's how we want it to be. So thank you for that. And uh, what else have I got going on? Oh, uh, another thing that's going to be coming up next week is the Conklin Duraflex. It's basically a Duragraph. I've talked about this in Q&A a couple of weeks ago, uh, but uh, it's a steel nib flex pen, and uh, it actually writes pretty darn well. I don't have a great way to do it. I'll probably have to bust this out in a right now once we uh, actually get them in stock next week. So be on the lookout for that. But um, this one is going to be coming. It's going to be $60. Go ahead and sign up on the email notification list. We're getting a lot of them. So I don't anticipate that they're going to all blow out right away. Um, and we should be following up with some more uh, in a couple of weeks. So even if they happen to sell out, we're going to get more in. So that was pretty exciting. And then um, this is kind of a little a little uh, teaser here for you, but <clears throat> uh, it looks like we're going to have a special visitor here with us next week, uh, Dante Del Vecchio, who is now the kind of head of pen design at Penider. So he's kind of infamous uh, for most of you in the pen world. Um, he is a founder of a previous uh, pen company that he's no longer associated with, but uh, now he's the head at Penider, and apparently Penider is going to be coming out with some cool stuff, and we're going to get to see some of that cool stuff. Uh, they're coming on Wednesday next week, so I don't know if we'll do any live video stuff on Wednesday. We're still kind of planning that out, um, but we are going to look to announce some things probably later that week. Um, we'll have stuff up on our website, and we'll get to show you some, some cool new pens um, that you can expect from there. Penider has been a paper brand for like hundreds of years. Pens are kind of a newer thing for them, but Dante is a uh, pretty active pen guy, and I think you can expect to see some interesting things come out of that. So be on the lookout for that. It's not often you see like completely new things like that come out of the pen world, so um, it should be kind of interesting to watch the history kind of unfold, if you will. 
All right, let's get to the questions, shall we? I have six questions for you this week. Um, and, you know, it was interesting. Now that we're doing the right now thing, I'm like, you know, how is that going to change Q&A? It's like we've been doing Q&A for four and a half years. And I'm really kind of like loving the feeding off of somebody else. And I've done Goulet guests where it's like a sit down and you just interview. And I've done Q&A where it's just me and reviews where it's pretty much just me. I really like the dynamic of having other people. Um, so I was like, man, Q&A, I wonder if it's going to feel any different now. But I'm also very comfortable talking in front of the camera. It's like riding a bike. And it's funny, we have a chalkboard in our, uh, if you saw the Q&A 200, uh, I have the chalkboard in our, our um, rec room, if you will. Uh, and uh, <laughs> the, the prompts that we have right now, because the Olympics are going on, is like, you know, if you could win a gold medal in any sport, real or fake, what would it be? And I, I put my gold medal as endurance talking. <laughs> because I thought that would be very fitting. Anywho, um, all right, so let's start out with some pen and writing questions. Uh, this first one is from at Cossie Group on Twitter. My, ten, my pens have been tuned to perfection and I love them. Sadly, this means I've plateaued. What can I do now? Buy other pens that I don't need? Get weird pens for the sake of their weirdness? I love having great pens, but miss the naive wonder of novice pendom. I like your verbiage there too. Very poetic kind of in your in your questioning there, Cossie Group. So um, I do empathize kind of where you're coming from. I think about this a lot, especially because I spend so much time immersed in the pen world that um, you know when I interact with people that are really, really new to it, I do kind of remember like, oh man, I remember when like, you know, just discovering like a Twisby for the first time or discovering a stub nib for the first time was like mind blowing. And now it's just, you know, you get used to that. And so it takes kind of a more uh, rare and special and over the top thing to achieve that same excitement when you've been in deep in the hobby, like nine years, like I have. So um, I do empathize with what you're saying. You know, I think, yeah, the magic can maybe wear off a little bit as you gain some experience. For me, though, it's like the deeper I get into it, the more excited I get because I get deeper and deeper technically and um, I get to discover more about it. The thing I can say is, you know, if I add up the number of hours probably that I have spent learning pen knowledge, yes, I've had like time where I've spent like running a business and that's like kind of almost agnostic to pens themselves. But if you take just the number of hours that I've shot videos about ten pens, researched pens, played with pens, talked about, you know, just, just all the time that I've spent just in using pens, all that, um, it's probably easily an entire lifetime's worth of time that any kind of just normal person would spend writing with a pen, uh, the amount of time that I've spent doing it over the last nine years or so. So I can say fairly confidently that you could, you know, learn and spend an entire lifetime's worth of a hobby of, uh, of learning about fountain pens and still not have discovered it all. In fact, it's like the more you know, the more you know you don't know. Uh, I very much feel like that from my own personal experience. Um, but there's always, <laughs> the thing I've always learned is there's always a place in the pen world for you to feel like a novice again. Um, and I'm going to give you some different ways that you can maybe do that, some different places you can discover that maybe you haven't thought about before. Um, so for those of you who are relatively new to the pen hobby, you got to just kind of learn the basics and how's a pen work and learning about different ink and stuff like that. For those of you who've been around it for a little while, um, maybe I can spark some ideas and give you some little motivation to kind of maybe go down a new rabbit hole to kind of keep things fresh and alive feeling for you because that's part of the fun, right? The journey is the reward, right? Um, so I kind of, as I was, I mean, and this was like super rough, but I kind of um, ended up coming up with, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five, six different groups. Not as catchy, I should probably end on like a five or seven or something like that. But anyway, it's six different groups um, of solid ideas that I think that you could kind of go down the rabbit hole to learn more about pens. Um, first one I call technical geekery, uh, which could be learning about different filling mechanisms, getting into obscure materials, maybe repairs and restoration, nib tuning. So basically like diving deeper into technically like how the pens work, the physics of it, the build, the mechanics, repairing, fixing, all that kind of stuff. Um, just really, and you can, you can become 
you can almost spend an entire lifetime just on like one really popular model of pen. I think about people I've seen at pen shows who get, say, deep into like the Parker 51 or they repair Schaefer snorkels or something like that. Like that becomes like their thing and they basically just focus on that. So you can definitely go deeper technically into the pens themselves. Uh, another area that I think is historical. So you can go vintage, maybe deep into particular brands, particular countries and regions, uh, maybe periods of history that have shaped how fountain pens have come about. Like maybe you're a huge fan of like World War II era pens or, you know, uh, the golden age of flex pens or something like that. Um, there's definitely like uh, for, for some people, I think they're motivated by kind of culture, the cultural aspect of it, and because fountain pens have been around for you know, 150 years or so, you can pick one pen brand like, you know, Pilot Namiki, for example. You can learn that, like, you know, it was started 100 years ago in uh, 1918. It started out as Namiki, but around World War II, because of some of the drama that had gone on in World War II, the name Namiki was not as marketable, especially in the U.S. and Europe, so they changed it to Pilot, and then later Namiki became kind of the higher-end brand, and then so there's pens that have started out as Namiki and shifted to Pilot brand. And so uh, it's just interesting to see even like within a company how history and culture has shaped and evolved within fountain pens. So certainly there's a historical aspect to it that can be uh, really interesting. Uh, I think artistry, uh, specifically if you get into things like Machier or get into handmade stuff, sterling silver, there's kind of a craftsmanship aspect to um, a lot of different types of fountain pens. Um, certainly nib tuning could fit into that maybe as well, but just definitely nib design and, and pen kind of, but I'm talking like more of the aesthetic uh, kind of aspect of the artistry of it. You know, specifically I think of Machier artists, Yurushi uh, artists who, you know, study for decades to be able to do this kind of stuff. And you can get entire like volumes of books about the techniques that are used in the artistry of Chinkin or uh, uh, Machier Yurushi. So, um, uh, I think that is something that you could explore. Uh, you could be get into collecting, so you could maybe dive into a certain brand, um, go on the hunt for something like Lamy Safaris or Pilot Vanishing Points or Esther Brooks, or Parker 51s, Shaper Snorkels. There's, you could go deep into any of these pens where, especially if they've been around for decades, um, you, can, you can get into those and you can even go really higher end if you want to uh, start feeling like a novice, get into limited edition stuff. Certainly there's plenty of Mont Blanc collectors out there, uh, plenty of, of higher end brands that you could get into collecting or maybe there's certain themes, like if you really love blue, you collect every blue pen you find. I don't know, that would be a lot of pens, but or maybe you just love celluloid, you love a particular material and you want to collect your Bakelite, you know, just obscure materials and you want to go out and collect all of them, uh, you know, it could be really interesting. Uh, abalone shell is another one. I know a lot of people who, you know, are, are really into that style. Um, so you could just become like a collector uh, and look to kind of like round out your collection and learn about that. Um, you can do uh, what I call creative. So actually using the pens as tools. So it, you, you can dive into improving your handwriting or maybe learning how to draw, doing some calligraphy. Um, producing creative works of some kind, stippling. There's a lot of different techniques that I've seen people use fountain pens. It's actually pretty fascinating. Um, and maybe that can drive your passion in a new direction that isn't necessarily centralized on learning more about the pens themselves, but about using them as a tool around some other passion that you have. I think specifically about like urban sketching or something like that. Like maybe there's something out there that you can explore where the pen kind of is along for the journey, uh, but isn't maybe like the central kind of piece of that. So there's something you could explore there. Uh, and then the last one I have is uh, what I call benefactor, uh, which is kind of what I do. Uh, I think the best way to learn is to teach. And the more that you share with others what you already know, the more exciting it can be, especially if you do something like you start a blog, you start doing some video uh, reviews or education type stuff. You can start your own Facebook group, kind of become an expert in the community, you know, have an active Instagram account, whatever that is. Um, when you share and engage with other people in the community and share your knowledge, that alone can increase your excitement quite a bit. And I know this from personal experience because that's still what drives me today um, as I get really excited. And I'm gonna get super deep into a couple of technical things even in this Q&A here where the questions from the community drove me to spend a couple hours researching this week even as busy as I am right now because I just wanted to know and share that information better. So that it can help keep the excitement alive too. 
Um, I find Instagram is a really great place to find just general inspiration visually because fountain pens can be a very visually pleasing uh, you know, medium, I guess. And uh, I find I personally spend uh, a disproportionate amount of time on Instagram these days just because it's very easy to kind of find what the community is doing because people are hashtagging their posts on Instagram. You can click around on those hashtags. You can actually follow hashtags now. Um, so you can. it's very easy to kind of see a certain theme or a certain idea. If you really love bullet journaling with fountain pens, you can search those hashtags and find out who's doing it. You can follow people. You can follow their stories and get super connected there. So um, that is sometimes what I see and like, oh man, that's kind of cool. I never thought to do that. Um, you know, I saw like, um, you know, Hey Matthew, for example, has like, um, you, if you follow me on Instagram, I did like this kind of, uh, you know, uh, graffiti like kind of, uh, you know, scratching uh, uh, with my pen to get kind of this look and, and Matthew, Matthew uh, Hey Matthew on Instagram was kind of an inspiration for that because I've seen him do a bunch of stuff like that. So you can just get inspired just by uh, different things that people are creating there. So hopefully you can grab something out of that. Uh, if you can't get excited about that, then, you know, just keep doing your thing and, and it'll come. You know, if you don't have to force it, you know, try dabbling in a couple of things, but, you know, maybe just maybe let it simmer down for a while. Just kind of enjoy where you're at and then, you know, eventually something else will spark, I think. All right, next question I have is from Gabriel P. on Facebook. Are stub nib sizes consistent between brands? It would make sense that they did since stubs explicitly say how broad the nib is in millimeters, but it doesn't seem that way from the nib nook pictures. Okay, so <laughs> the short answer is yes and no. Uh, there is definitely some consistency of the nib size itself. Um, however, the line that it actually draws on the page is perhaps somewhat less consistent than you would probably like. Uh, you know, that's part of the reason why I developed the Nibnook tool in the first place is like, it's all well and good whether it says it's fine or broad or a 1.0 millimeter stub. What does it actually look like on the page? Because that can vary from pen to pen, from model to model, and from brand to brand. And, uh, you know... Uh, yes, it's true that when you put a number to anything, it seems more precise. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't go for like in a completely in-depth, super research mode on all the pens I have, but I did grab four of them uh, across a couple different brands because I wanted to see just how consistent uh, they were. So what I ended up doing is I grabbed a um, Visconti Steel Stub Nib. Um, this is actually one that I had from the uh, Art of Writing set from a couple of years ago, and I, I'm now realizing I left the pen body over there, but I have the grip section here uh, that has the nib, and that's really the most important part. I also have a uh, Lamy 1.5 millimeter nib. I have a Pilot, um, what was it, the Enzo set here. So this is a Pilot Plumix set that has three different sizes of stub nibs, and uh, so I grabbed the medium one off that, and then I have a Pilot Vanishing Point with a 1.0 millimeter stub. And I thought, okay, I have some stubs here ranging 1.0 to 1.5. Let me actually measure them and see what the difference is. So I have actually two different ways to measure them. One of them is I have a set of calipers here. So this is actually um, more commonly what you'll see as the measuring tool for these pens. Like for example, I have, and maybe I'll zoom in a little bit here so you can see kind of more what I'm doing. Uh, Hey, what's up? So I'm gonna show you the nib here. I'll look off to the side so I can see what I'm doing. I have a monitor over here so that I can see very closely what I'm doing. So I have my calipers, okay, ta-da, boom. So my calipers, get it all the way down. Okay, it's at zero. And uh, let me see if I can do this so that you can see what I'm doing. Oh boy, I've not tried this. I'm doing this left-handed now. Um, so basically the width of the nib, you gotta get it like pretty much right at the tip and this is gonna be really hard because I'm doing it left-handed here. But this is the idea. Let me get in frame. Oh gosh, this is harder than I realized to do it left-handed. But there you go. So I wanna try and get it like as close to the tip as possible. Now this is a steel nib, so it does not have any tipping material on it. So I'm grabbing it right at the tip there, 1.49, okay? So it's a 1.5 millimeter nib, 1.49, pretty dang close. Uh, and so then what I did was I took and I wrote out, let's see if I can find my writing. 
wrote out with that nib. Rhodia dot pad paper. This is uh, Noodler's black ink. So pretty standard. Yes, if you use a different paper, different ink, you might actually get a different line thickness. But this is what I've standardized all of the Nibnook writing samples on is this exact uh, thing. And I have this really cool tool here that I had never seen one of these before. But thanks to my buddy Brian Gray, I was able to learn about this thing. This is a microscope that um, you put it on the paper and you look down through it. And I don't think I'm going to be able to show you because it's just too fine. But it has this like kind of measuring device in here. And I'm going to zoom out now because... I'm super close up on you. Uh, so it allows you to kind of put this down on the page. You look down through this, this microscope and it shows you down to the 10th of a millimeter, I think it is. Let me verify that real quick. Down to the, sorry, hundredth, hundredth of a millimeter. No, 10th of a millimeter. Hundredth would be insane. 10th of a millimeter. It has these little like tick marks down to the 10th of a millimeter. And uh, you can see how wide your line is actually on the page. Uh, it's very cool. So I did that for a couple of different nibs. So um, again, this is just kind of me doing this. This is not, I have not tested like 100 samples of each nib size. So this is just one nib that I've grabbed of each of these. So I'm not like able to say like definitively, this is what you should expect. Because the thing you have to keep in mind with this is there is handwork involved with rounding these nibs over and stuff like that. So there's gonna be some degree of variation. And even in my own writing, I'm a human, and so my writing might be different. And so I tried to find like a nice middle ground somewhere. Uh, but anyway, so what I found with the Visconti Steel Stub 1.5, it's fairly close to that. Um, depends on exactly where you get it, because the problem you have with the stub nibs is they're very rounded. So depending on where exactly you grab with the calipers, but it was pretty close. Um, I actually ended up on the page getting about a 1.2 millimeter line. So I wasn't getting a full 1.5 because think about it, the 1.5 is at the very edges, but these things are rounded over. So you're not going to get ink going all the way out to the very, very edge because it's rounded like that. So depending on from nib to nib, depending on how much that edge is rounded over is going to be how much of it is getting kind of cut off, if you will. So I got a 1.2 millimeter line on the Visconti stub. I also did the Lamy 1.5. The Lamy 1.5 nib was actually slightly wider. It was 1.6 millimeters. Now you're talking about a tenth of a millimeter. It's not very much. Uh, but the actual line that it ended up drawing was 1.2, exactly the same as the Visconti steel stub. So both of those in the nib nook are going to look nearly identical. But when you hold them up to each other, you may notice it's it's subtle but if i look at it really closely the lamy looks a little bit wider go figure but they're both advertised at 1.5 um the pilot so this is where it got really interesting because the pilot plumix hand lettering set and i've been shooting emails back and forth with pilot and this is you know it's a nine dollar and fifty cent pen um, but still i want to know what's going on so the pilot um, they came out with these hand lettering sets one of which is the plumix hand lettering set that comes with a what they call a fine medium and broad um, stub nib and uh, the medium one is the same stub that we've been carrying the same one that we have been um, uh, you know, selling on the Plumix as a 1.0 millimeter and the same one that we have on the Prera and the Metropolitan as a 1.0 millimeter, right? So I'm like, okay, interesting. Well, I look over on the back of the dang box and I see that the numbers are different. So it has the, oh, here we go. It has the fine nib one as 0.4 millimeter, the medium as a 0.58 millimeter and the broad as a 0.7 millimeter. So I'm looking at this and I'm like, what's going on? Have I been measuring things wrong all this time? So I shot emails back and forth. I'm talking to Japan, trying to get some clarity on this. What I've been able to uh, surmise so far is um, the we're getting into some of the difference between the actual width and the line width. So what they advertise on the back of the box for the hand lettering set is the actual line width on the page, which of course could vary just a little bit, but um, I was able to kind of confirm that. So when I, when I did that, I took the calipers and I measured the steel 1.0 millimeter stub that we've been offering for like seven years and i got it was like 0.96 millimeters which is close enough to one millimeter right so uh that's pretty accurate when i actually drew the line on the page it was 0.6 millimeters which is really really close to 0.58 
Okay, so that's the discrepancy you're seeing there. And that's how they've been advertising it on the, the Metropolitan and the Prera and the Plumix previously was the actual physical width of the nib, but then the actual line drawn, because it's a hand lettering set, is what they put on the back of the box. So try not to be too confused by that, um, but it does need to be nuanced and explained a little bit because that's what's going on. So if you think about that, it's a one millimeter nib, but you're only getting 60% of the width of that nib. Because it's a relatively thinner nib, you're losing about 60%, or sorry, for, you're losing 40% of the width, which is not completely off. I mean, it's not quite as drastic um, on the 1.5 Visconti and the Lamy one, going from 1.5 to 1.2. Well, it's about that much for the Lamy one, though. If you got 1.6 going down to 1.2, it's about the same ratio there. I can't math right now with these decimals and stuff, but um, <laughs> going from one millimeter to a 0.6 millimeter seems fairly drastic. So that's why there can be some inconsistencies from one to the other, because when you get something that's one millimeter or even finer, you get that thing rounded over, it can seem a little drastic. So, um, and then just to kind of test one more, I did, I wanted to do a gold nib because I wanted to do one that was tipped. So um, I did that with the, um, the Pilot Vanishing Point. And this thing was freaking like 1.0 exactly down to the hundredth of a millimeter. It was 1.0 millimeters. And I was like, Ooh, okay. Um, and you can tell there's like more handwork involved in a gold nib like this. So that thing was precise. Uh, and then the uh, line width that I got on this was 0.65 millimeters. So the, the line width on this 1.0 millimeter was actually slightly wider than what you had on the um, stub uh, uh, of the Plumix. So even having the same measurement, even the same brand having two different nibs, you're gonna get a slight bit of variation. That's why the nib nook is so important. Um, I've talked with my team about like, hey, we should actually measure the, the nib width, the physical nib width and the line width and all this kind of stuff. It is such a massive project. Like it's so time consuming. Um, and it can vary a little bit from nib to nib. So we'd have to test a couple different ones. It's such a daunting feeling project. I'm gonna have to really try to wrap my head around this one, but um, it was kind of interesting just to see like, wow, there actually is quite a bit of difference with a stub at least, and I'm sure to a degree with rounded nibs um, of, of um, the, the measured line uh, the, sorry, the measured width of the nib and the actual line width. So that's something interesting now to explore. It hopefully won't confuse you more than answer some of your questions here, Gabriel, but uh, that's what I got for you today. Super interesting. You're getting to see a little more like real time. I mean, I was measuring this stuff like an hour ago. So you're getting a little bit more real time of the information that I'm discovering. I am by no means an expert, right? I've gotten a little bit of nib training. I've gotten a little bit of knowledge. I have resources like pilot and stuff to reach out to, to try to amass this information. But um, I'm in it for almost nine years and still learning, still learning about this stuff. So this is uh, the kind of stuff that interests me a lot. I got to dive deep. My time is limited, so I can't dive super, super, super deep and do the entire project in like an afternoon. Uh, but I can at least learn enough to educate you a little bit and uh, maybe just give you enough to <laughs> have a lack of confidence in what's been out there. No, no, no. But seriously, it what what it does to me is reinforces like, okay, the nib nook really is a helpful tool because you get to see an actual nib on the page and see how it actually writes, which is really at the end of the day, what matters. It doesn't matter what something nib size it says it is. What matters is, you know, what it looks like on the page and how practical it is for you to actually use it. Cool. All right. Next question is from Scott S on Facebook. Brian, why is no one like Noodler's designed a set of pens that have interchangeable parts. Three types of nibs, three types of finger grips, three types of fills, 10 different barrels. I imagine they would add more barrel designs and finger grips through the year and so forth. Um, so it's a good question. You know, there's a lot, a lot to it there, uh, but I can draw upon my experience back when I was making pens 10 years ago. Uh, I didn't have interchangeable parts but I did have a lot of customized options in terms of trim options, certainly variety of materials and all this kind of stuff. And in fact, one of me and Rachel's first like web projects was to build a like custom pen builder thing for, cause I was actually making the pens custom and I had all these parts and pieces and I could make them however you want, which is how it goes when there's custom. Um, anybody who's been involved in custom work, you probably know that 
most of your work will end up, it's kind of like an 80-20 rule, like 80% of the people are going to want like a couple of designs, a couple of features or nice colors or whatever. And then like 20% are going to want completely random oddball stuff. So you would think that like the more options you offer, the better. Not necessarily the case, because unless somebody gets like a master's degree in pen parts, you know, they're not going to really know everything they need to know to make the perfect choice about what it is they want. So it has to be it has to be factored in a little bit. And so Rachel and I actually built a site where we had all these different models of pens, all these different, uh, we weren't even selling fountain pens at this point. This was just roller balls. So we didn't even have nib size and stuff to get into. But we had all these different materials and, and stuff like that. I think we ended up with, in, in, in order to buy one pen, you had 14,000 different combinations. And we thought, this is the best. People can get exactly what they want. Do you know how many pens we sold? And we had a website where you could have 14,000 different options. Zero. Absolutely zero. And the feedback was, it was so entirely overwhelming to try to pick all this stuff that nobody could actually make a decision and they would just move on because it was just too much effort. Um, whereas if you actually build something and any of you who are artists, you know, you could paint a picture about anything, but if you paint something and people can see what it actually is, then they're going to want it. So people are funny, but, um, you know, I would say that probably three options are usually best. Generally speaking, more than that. And the domain is going to drop off significantly. Um, trying to stock all these different parts and pieces, understanding how they all work together and trying to distribute them through all different retailers and stock all those different parts is super unappealing from a logistical standpoint. And uh, I think that's the reason, frankly, why you don't see this happening a lot. Um, you do see it happening a little bit more when you're buying direct from the manufacturer, you know, especially if you think about like any high end anything, you know, if you get a bespoke car or a bespoke you know, whatever, tailored suit or something like that. There's going to be a lot more options. There's going to be a lot more time involved. Your cost is going to go up quite a bit, but you're not going to get custom tailored suits that are mass produced and available at your local department store. It's just not possible logistically. So you have to go more direct to the source. Um, so that in mind, the companies that I've seen kind of go a little more in this direction is a company like Keras Customs. Um, so Keras Customs has, we carry some of their pens and a couple of options in terms of grips and stuff, but not nearly as many as they have on their site. So with their site, um, they granted they only have a couple of different models, but you can get a uh, different body, different grip, different nib, and you can kind of mix it up um, between the different, really different color and a couple of material options. And even then the, the, the you know, the offering can get somewhat expansive, but you can kind of get a little more what you want and they can put it together. Um, another brand that I've seen uh, have some success with this is Edison. Um, so we carry Edison uh, in their production line, which is much more limited capacity, um, but they make custom pens as well. That's actually how they started out with doing custom stuff and doing pen shows and taking custom orders. They still do that. It's called their signature series. Um, and they're actually quite busy and successful with that. Um, in addition to the production line, which is what we as a retailer offer. Um, so they offer certain models that you can only get through their custom line and they offer certainly a variety of materials. And uh, I don't know if they do this for like just anybody anymore, but I know that they have in the past taken custom orders and actually like modified the length of the pen or the grip or like done like really custom stuff, not just changing out different materials, but really custom stuff. Um, you know, I, don't, I hesitate to say like, yeah, go reach out to them right now because they really want you to do that because they're busy as heck. Um, but I know they have done that before. Um, so a pen like this, this is a Premier that I had done custom, which is made out of this like yellow and white swirl. Um, and uh, let's see, I've got to turn my sound off. So, um, you know, you can do that kind of thing through a company like Edison where they make it kind of a little more on demand. Um, what else do I have? Uh, Tactile Turn is another one. I don't have that model uh, anymore. Um, we carried a kind of a production thing. They kind of overhauled some stuff, but you can go. They offered like the same kind of thing like Keras Customs, a lot of different material options, a couple different models, that kind of thing. So a quick little shout out to Will Hodges there. Um, probably the closest thing that I've seen in the fountain pen world to what you're specifically asking about here 
is a small company uh, called Osprey Pens, and uh, they got a website out there. They're um, pretty active on Instagram, and uh, they have a pen called the Milano. And this was kind of how the Milano was designed, was to have some interchangeable part options and materials and nibs and things like that. So um, this is an ebonite pen. Actually, they're fairly affordable too. And uh, I just throw them a little love so you can go check out their site, support them a little bit. They're a newer company, smaller company, um, but they believe strongly in uh, supporting local schools as well. So part of their, their contribution that they do is they supply pens to schools when you buy pens from them. So um, you can check that out. But um, they're probably the ones that I've seen the most that have tried to develop this like interchangeable uh, part thing. But uh, I can say as a retailer, it does create challenge in terms of like the complexity of actually offering it and education and stuff like that. Uh, it gets infinitely more complicated. So um, that gives you a little bit of insight there. A lot of it's logistics, a lot of it's, um, you know, just practicality there. Um, the thing I can say as a retailer is it's always nice to be able to offer a zillion different options. But in a way, from my side of the logistical end, it's almost not nice because it becomes infinitely more complex to really help you and tailor exactly what it is that you want. Yes, you can have a lot of options, but the the number of ways that you could get exact not exactly what you like are also um, you know, a lot more complex too. So, um, and it makes it uh, a little bit harder for somebody to kind of simply get into into something. So, I don't know. I don't see it like being this huge like boom. Uh, of opportunity in the pen community is having something interchangeable like this. I know it seems like that would be really nice. I think probably having certain certain parts or pieces on certain pens available, like swappable nibs on the Lamy uh, pens, for example, is a really good good example of something that it's easy enough to get into. The nib already comes on the pen, but you can swap out the nib for something different. It's relatively easy to kind of get into and, and swap it out yourself. But if you had to like custom build your own Lamy pen and you were just getting into the hobby, it would be very overwhelming. So anyway, that's my two cents on the whole meal, on the whole ordeal. And I'm gonna take a sip of coffee if you don't mind. Hmm. This next question, just make me squirm in my seat a little bit. Put me on the spot, Kathleen. This is from Kathleen P on Facebook. Asks, thoughts on how quality control is going at Visconti? I see some great new Van Gogh and Rembrandt colors are planned. So the, um, you know, this is the kind of thing that like, I'm an, I'm an authorized retailer of Visconti for sure. I'm also a pen reviewer. And, you know, I'm trying to be as absolutely authentic and genuine and above board as possible with all things positive and negative, right? Um, so yeah, I've, I've talked about Visconti like nib issues and stuff in Q&A before. I always try to have a balanced perspective on that because I'm an avid pen user, I'm also a retailer. So I don't want you to think like, I'm gonna say, ah, oh, yeah, it's great, everything's great, just because I'm a retailer. Like I take to heart all the feedback that I hear on all the products that we carry, I really, really do. Sometimes it takes a while to actually, you know, find out what's going on like when there's deep complex issues it takes me a while to figure out what's going on and maybe provide feedback and it takes time for things to actually happen but i do take it all to heart and i think most of you who have seen goulet pens for a while you know that we do that uh but so um i actually it's a timely question which is why i wanted to take it because i actually just met with um, the distributor uh, for visconti in the u.s it's coles of london we just came here last week had really productive conversation. Um, something that we've uh, really tried to have a focus on is being a little bit more reflective about what's happened. Um, and so as we closed out our uh, 2017 year end here, we gave a breakdown of like all of our top manufacturers and gave them a rundown of you know, how things sold, what sold, what didn't sell, any stock issues that we had, customer sentiment, quality issues, you know, internal logistics, communication, all that kind of stuff. We summarized all of that. It's been a lot of time with me and my team um, to really try to give some constructive feedback and kind of a year-end reflection. We're giving that kind of stuff constantly kind of throughout the year, but we really wanted to put it together into a multi-page summary and, and provide that to our manufacturers, which I think is just, it's an unbelievable amount of time and work, but I think it's gonna be a really valuable key to um, you know constructively uh, improving on things every year and, and improving our relationships with our, our manufacturers. So that's something we did. We provided one for uh, Visconti, and uh, that was part of what we talked about in there was some of the sentiment uh, around the quality control. Specifically, it's really about the nibs, the way that the pens write. 
um, and, and more often than not, it's the palladium nibs um, having flow issues on certain pens. So uh, we talked about that. The thing I will say about that, and I've, I've talked about this before in Q&A, so I'm not going to you know, beat a dead horse here, but uh, the thing I will say is that um, some of the issues get a little bit blown out of proportion. I think because the pens are very expensive. They are certainly kind of a premium uh, quality brand pen, uh, premium, uh, uh, what's the word? Yeah, just premium, premium uh, uh, luxury, luxury uh, pen uh, for the most part. So uh, it draws a lot of attention, it draws a lot of attention from people that necessarily aren't buying the pen or have the pen or have experience with the pen, but are very happy to <laughs> jump on and, and perpetuate things that are being said about the pen. So there's always kind of like a megaphone effect that happens when there's a quality issue on any type of high-end product. It happens a lot. You know, people love to dig on something that's expensive, right? I get it. Um, so it's, it's naturally, there's some of that. It can equally work in their favor towards hype. If somebody's really gushing about some crazy high-end exotic pen, it can spread the same kind of thing. So, um, you know, I kind of shared all this with them and I said, look, there's some, some, some nib issues here that we really need to address. And I've been saying that for a while. They, they really have taken it to heart. I have definitely seen a noticeable change in some of the quality issues of their nibs in the last probably three or four months, and they are actively working to address some of these issues. Um, one of which, um, they are retooling the um, stainless steel nibs. Uh, so they are moving away from the stainless steel nibs they have been using. They're gonna be redoing them. There's gonna be a little bit of shifting. This is the topic of uh, our right now from Monday, number two, um, that I did with, no, number three, that I did with Drew. Uh, and Rachel. So right now, number three, we talked about, my memory's not that great, and this was only a couple days ago, um, but uh, we talked about specifically the Rembrandt uh, nibs, and we inked them up um, because they are, are redoing uh, those stainless steel nibs, and there's going to be some transition that's going to happen over probably the next six months or so while that's going on. So they're aware of it, and they are actively looking to re readdress it. It's difficult with a company that sells globally because there are a lot of different retailers or stockists, if you will. Um, and so it takes a while for product to kind of sell through. So for a reputation of a global brand to uh, be able to improve and change, it takes, I don't know, six months to a year to really kind of have the sentiment change around that, which is why it's important, I, I think, for, for manufacturers to address these types of issues uh, as soon as they possibly can. And they have been addressing it for some time, but it's taken a little bit to kind of figure out what's going on, especially with stuff like nibs, because things can look really good. And then unless you write with them for a while, you don't necessarily catch it right away. So you got to really kind of know what you're dealing with. Um, and they are um, addressing these things. So I'm encouraged by what I'm not just what I'm hearing in terms of what they are trying to address, but in terms of what I'm seeing in terms of steps that they're actually taking. So that's very encouraging to me. And of course, it's always with the caveat that being an authorized retailer, we, we love Visconti, we believe in the brand, and we completely back them. So if you buy any pen from us and you are not happy with it, we will definitely work with you on that one. So, um, you know, I think the QC is going in the right direction. Um, I got to see in my hands some of the pens that they're coming out with this year and they are pretty dang cool so the new rembrandts that you see now are pretty cool there's going to be some other stuff that's coming out some of which i got to see some of which i didn't i only got to see stuff that's going to be launching over the next couple of months which is going to be made public fairly soon excuse me a couple of high-end things a couple of lower-end things um, but uh, I think you'll be encouraged by some of what Visconti's working on. So it'll be an exciting year for them for 2018. I'm optimistic in the direction that they're moving, and I'm appreciative of all the feedback that we've gotten from you all about that because it's it's uh, helping us to drive them to uh, make make better and cooler pens. So it's, that's kind of how it works, you know. That's just really good um, way that this whole retailer, manufacturer, customer process works. All right, this next question is from Kevin L on Facebook. Shouldn't demonstrator fountain pens be piston fillers and not cartridge converters to be the real deal? Well, you know, it's interesting, Kevin, because I usually when I think of demonstrators, pistons come to mind first, I think. But honestly, the, the whole term demonstrator, uh, I don't know that it necessarily means piston filler. I think it means you just you can see the inner workings of the pen. Um, now I, this is where like, I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm like a step, like one foot over into this territory of like 
history of demonstrator pens. I've talked about this a little bit before, but basically demonstrator pens were used by pen sellers, the, the sales reps and stuff that would go to retailers to show new products and show how they worked. Um, and they would oftentimes have parts labeled and stuff. And they would show these, they would have these clear pens that would be um, used to demonstrate how the pen actually functioned to the retailers so that they could explain it. Um, at that time, you know, think about the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, a lot of pens were fairly plain, dark, um, you know, solid colors. Uh, you were not necessarily getting into these like exotic acrylics and stuff like that. Just the technology wasn't quite there at that time. So um, you would have these clear pens. They weren't necessarily made to be used. They were just made to demonstrate how things worked. So nowadays, I don't know exactly when it kind of shifted to be like the term demonstrator meant a clear pen uh, that, you know, could mean even a, a, a tinted colored, uh, mostly clear pen. Uh, but that's certainly what it means today. And that's the terms that we use very often is, uh, you know, when is a pen a demonstrator and when is it not a demonstrator? The line is kind of fuzzy. It's like, when is an ink blue black? And when is it just dark blue? Um, that's a good question. There's kind of a blurry line there. Um, but uh, yes, I think traditionally when you think of a piston filling pen that is clear like this, you think, okay, that's a demonstrator pen. Something like the Twisby, this is a Twisby 580 all, very obviously demonstrator, you get to see the ink inside, you get to see the nib as you screw it into the cap, you get to see the piston mechanism working as you, uh, you know, move it up and down. Very comfortable calling this a demonstrator. But what about other pens? You know, it's like you have a pen that's a, uh, like Conklin has a crescent filler. Uh, this is a colored demonstrator or a tinted demonstrator that is a crescent filler. And if you see this, you know, they put a clear sack inside of here so you can see the ink. It's not inked right now. But you can see there the crescent with the um, pressure bar is compressing that sack and it's allowing you to see how it's working. Fundamentally, isn't this really just the same thing as a piston? Or I think about like the cartridge converter pen, like the Lamy Vista. The Vista is literally just a Lamy Safari that's clear. In fact, when they first came out with the pen, they called it the Safari Vista. And Vista just means you can see, or it's like an overlook where you can see clearly. Uh, and that's why they called it the Vista, is because you can see clearly what's going on inside the pen. And you can see your cartridge converter inside of there, sure, but technically you can see how the pen functions on the inside. Or if you have something like a vacuum filler, this is a Pilot Custom 823. It is tinted as well. The grip is dark, so you can't get see all the innards, but for sure you can see the ink sloshing around as it's going. You get to see the mechanism moving back and forth as you are filling and using the pen. And uh, I would call this one a demonstrator as well. Probably a tinted demonstrator or a colored demonstrator. But me personally, I would feel comfortable calling all of these pens demonstrator. Now it gets to be rather tricky when you have other pens where you have, you know, think about like maybe the Twisby Eco, where the body of the pen is clear, but the cap is solid. Is that still a demonstrator? Where do you actually draw that line? And I don't know that I am the authority to say this is where the line is drawn and this is where it is not. In fact, I don't know that anybody really has the authority to say that that is the case because it's a term that I think kind of came out of use in the pop culture of fountain pen lifestyle, if you will. So, um, you know, I think it can mean whatever it is that we determine it to mean. I think for me, probably where I would draw the line is if you can see, it's tough because like, there's plenty of pens that have an ink window. Like I think about the Stipula Toco Ferro, which I don't know if I have that pen on me or not. I think I have it in my pen case, but I'm gonna go grab it because I'm feeling demonstratory kind of mood. So give me a hot second here. Where is my stipula? Here is the Toco Ferro. And I'm going to grab the Twisby Eco 42 since I just mentioned that one. So the Twisby Eco right here. So is this a demonstrator pen? The cap is solid. The back finial is solid. But the grip and the things, I think most people would call this a demonstrator. But what about the stipula Toco Ferro? Okay, this one the body is iron, the cap is iron, the grip is metal, and when you move the piston down, you can see the piston moving. There we go. Stipula does theirs backwards. So you got to you can see it moving, you can see the ink, 
is this a big ink window or is this a demonstrator pen? I would say that it's just an ink window. I would not say it's a demonstrator unless you can actually see the mechanism working on the inside. So I think that's where I draw the line. I call it a demonstrator if you can see the mechanism working. That's where I draw the line. Whether or not that's official, I don't really know. But that's what I'm going to say. If you agree with me, great. If not, great. I don't really know. <laughs> but either way, I definitely don't think that it's exclusive to piston filling pens. At least not in my book. And that's not how we have them categorized at Goulet pens either. They're uh, almost agnostic to filling mechanism on our site. Okay? I'm going to close this week out with a business question. This is from Hattie Palms on Twitter. I've noticed over the last few months the number of interviews you've done and places you've traveled to interview and tour. Question, where would you love to go next, place or tour? And what would your dream interview or interviewee be? Uh, I definitely have been traveling more. It's uh, it just kind of stacked up that way. It wasn't like, I'm going to travel the heck out of myself between Christmas and, you know, or between like December and January, like the busiest time of year where I have both my kids' birthdays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, company party, everything. I'm just going to pack it all in. Why not? Uh, no, it just kind of ended up stacking up that way. Those were the opportunities that came about. I didn't necessarily choose the dates, but um, that's when it came out. So I traveled to uh, Germany for Lamy in early December. I went, uh, did a bunch of traveling um, for the holidays, my family. Granted, my family's not far. Rachel's uh, parents live up in the D.C. area. It's about a two-hour drive. Um, we also had Rachel's grandmother pass away, so we had to drive up to Pennsylvania for one weekend. I traveled to uh, Milan, Ohio to visit Edison Pens, and then I went to California for a business conference. Uh, so I was kind of all over the place. Like, I think for eight out of the eight or nine weeks in a row, I think I was traveling for seven of them. It was, it was really just a lot. I've never traveled that much before in my life. Uh, and it was, you know, I got a little bit of a, uh, what it feels like to kind of live out of your suitcase a little bit. And I was like, okay, you know, kind of towards the end of that, I was like, all right, the glamour's wearing off just a little bit. Uh, I want to kind of be home and see my kids and just, you know, be, be kind of normal for a bit. Um, but that was cool. So now I don't have any trips really. I've got like one trip planned out. I've got a few others that are kind of, uh, you know, in the works, uh, possibly, but nothing like completely solid. I think I only have like one actual trip booked uh, in May. So, uh, you know, I just, it's kind of open right now. And I think I'm going to kind of chill out for just a little bit, uh, kind of catch my breath <laughs> a bit, take care of things on the home front. Uh, then maybe I'll think about traveling more like late summer or something like that. Um, you know, but for me, I, I just, I really enjoyed seeing Lamy. Um, I really enjoyed seeing Edison and how they work out. I eventually would love to just tour basically all of the factories of all the brains we carry. I'm, I'm really fascinated. You know, I started out with this from pen making. Um, I have kind of a somewhat of a technical operational mind. Uh, I'm not like an engineer by any means. But I definitely am very tactile and I understand just kind of how things work. So and I'm very fascinated by that. I've always loved the TV show, how it's made. I've always like been curious about how things work and how you build certain things. And it just it, it works for me and it really gets me pumped up. So I would love to go and see Visconti, you know, because they are in Florence, Italy, and it's gorgeous there. And their factory is like in a 15th century, you know, Italian villa. <laughs> it would be amazing. I've heard, I've heard that it's incredible there. Um, and just to kind of see how they do things. Likewise, I would like to see all basically all the other brands. I've, I've had, you know, um, the notion to uh, visit a bunch of different uh, uh, manufacturers in Italy, and I would love to see Pelican, and I would love to see uh, Conid uh, over there in Belgium. I would love to go to, you know, Clairefontaine and Rodia and see how the paper is made, and Jerbon and see how some ink is made, and uh, I'd love to go and meet Nathan Tardif in person. You know, I've been selling noodlers for seven and a half years now, and uh, I've never met Nathan Tardif in person. So uh, it would be, you know, kind of cool to make that happen. So, yeah, I think uh, a lot of my my motivation to travel is around, you know, um, kind of 
things that I want to learn or things that I want to do or people that I want to meet. You know, it's like I've met Gary Vaynerchuk in person. I met Dave Ramsey and Seth Godin. Uh, Godin. And, uh, you know, I've just, there's not a lot of like celebrities I would really want to meet at this point. Like I got to meet Jake Weidman and do an interview with him, uh, which was like, he was like kind of my, my, on my bucket list, right? Like, and now we're buddies. We're like text each other and <laughs> You know, I'm like buying his art and, you know, he's like sending me handwritten letters and stuff. It's, it's pretty cool. Uh, so, you know, I just, I don't have like any one crazy thing that's kind of out there. I would love to just kind of tour more. I'd love to see, um, you know, pilot in Japan, see how that works. That would be really cool. Um, you know, and just kind of see how different pen manufacturers uh, work. That would be really cool. So that's kind of like my main motivation for ever wanting to travel in the future. That or like on the personal front, you know, going places with my kids. I love the mountains. Um, my wife and I, um, we honeymooned in Estes Park, Colorado. I would love to go back there at some point. You know, we got married in 2006, so that was 12 years ago. Um, so it would be cool to be able to go back out there and see some real mountains. Now that I like know a lot more about photography and I have better gear, uh, it would be really cool to um, see, uh, you know, what I could do in that way. That would be pretty neat. So, you know, of course, Jake Weidman's out that way too. So it's like I'd have to give him a call if I ever go back out to Colorado. <laughs> that would be kind of cool. So I don't know. I guess interviewing Jake again would be pretty cool, maybe on his home turf and get to see his studio and stuff like that. That would, that would be pretty cool. I got to admit, that would be really cool. Um, other than that, you know, obviously I think like going to Italy would be pretty cool. Going to basically any place in Europe. Like I loved going to Germany. Um, even though it was a whirlwind of a trip for me, it was really cool. Frankfurt was cool. Heidelberg was cool. Um, and, uh, just getting to hang out with pen people, like everybody in the pen community is so cool. Even the manufacturers, like nobody does it because that's the best way to make money or because that's, you know, what they're father said they had to do they're all doing it because they love being in it you know they love being in the business being in the community and that stems basically all the way uh, from you all as, as pen users to me as a retailer to distributors manufacturers everybody does it because they love it and that I think you feel that you feel that in the community um, so for me getting to see like direct at the source like who are the people designing the pens and where do they find inspiration they just like beam they like resonate inspiration uh and it's just super super cool so really anybody just getting to meet anybody there that gets deeper into the pen stuff um you know if i do end up going to italy at some point going to see rome and the vatican would be pretty cool uh, as well just the history and the art and all that would be really really cool um and then you know i said uh, i mentioned about jake weidman um and getting to meet Gary V again would be pretty cool. You know, I think, because when I met him before, it was in 2014. It was very quick, and it was in very, um, I had kind of a cool moment with him. You know, he's he's basically the reason why I started shooting videos. So I, I owe him a lot just for really kind of laying that out, his book Crush It. And he actually just came out with his most recent book, Crushing It, which I'm in the process of reading. Um, and as I'm reading that book, I'm like, dang, I could freaking be in this book. Uh, <laughs> so maybe the next one, maybe when he does Crushing It, uh, we can be in that one. But uh, uh, when I met him before, our business was about half the size that it is now. And uh, to, to be a little bit further along and more mature and just kind of understanding more of what I'm doing now uh, would be cool to just kind of sit down, not even like do a full interview, but just to sit down with him for 10 minutes or so and just and talk a little bit uh, would be kind of cool. But and honestly, I've met enough people now where I know that there's, there's no like one single game-changing, life-changing thing um, that would come out of it. It's just uh, really cool experiences to have that kind of all stack up. So... Um, you know, I'm just, I'm kind of loving every day and I look at every opportunity to travel or every opportunity to do an interview with somebody as, um, just a really cool, you know, experience to be able to add, uh, to my collection of life experiences. So, um, yeah, I don't have like one specific answer for you, but that's just, that's kind of where I'm at right now. All right. So my question of the week for you this week, as we close out the Q and A is, uh, going back to all the way in the intro, uh, talking about the empty ink bottle, 2018 hashtag, uh, I'm curious for you, what's the next ink that you are going to finish or that you think you'll finish? Um, whether or not it's in 2018 or not, uh, but I'm very curious. If you're like me, Noodler's Black is, I have all these different inks. Noodler's Black is the only one that I've ever actually finished a bottle because I did, I did filled like half a bottle of, of Conpecky, which I have, I think, sitting up here. And then I had Noodler's Liberty's Elysium and then I had the next blue and the next blue and the next blue. So I have all these like, 
partially uh, emptied blue bottles, but I don't like stick with one blue long enough to actually use the whole thing. So uh, I'm curious to know what is yours that you think you would actually finish an entire bottle. And that's it for this week. I hope you've enjoyed this. Be sure to check out all the other things that we have going on because we are pounding out some video stuff lately at Goulet Pens. Thanks so much for watching and right on.